Nowadays, dozens of technologies have been developed to store information. And in each generation one of the main goals is to increase the amount of information we can store per unit volume. Through floppy disks, CDs, Blu-ray, hard disks, solid-state drives and even in recent years using DNA chains as a means to store information. Reaching densities of 5.5 petabytes per cubic millimeter, which is really impressive. However, these technologies have a major limitation, its duration, which is generally in the order of dozens or hundreds of years being stored under controlled conditions. But there is a technology that exceeds them in this aspect by a large margin, and we're talking about millions of years, even at temperatures above 180 degrees Celsius. In this video, we will see how an Eternal Quartz 5D data storage works. Let's start by analyzing what exactly is meant by five dimensions, and then we will focus on the duration. The first three are spatial dimensions. If we consider the first two, we can find technologies like punched cards or CD, DVD, and Blu-ray. In these examples, the information is stored on flat surfaces in the form of perforations or marks, which when analyzed can take only two states per section. That is, they deliver information in binary form. In other words, if a computer analyzes these surfaces, a perforation will be interpreted as a 1, and an unperforated section will be interpreted as a 0, which is also known as a bit of information, which should not be confused with a byte of information, more commonly used and equivalent to 8 bits. The logical evolution to store more information would be to add a third dimension perpendicular to the other two, or in simple terms, to mount multiple layers. However, in the previous examples, given the materials used and the way they are written and read, this is not possible. In the best case we could put multiple write and read systems on top of each other, as for example in some hard drives but it is difficult to categorize it as 3D if each of these systems is reading a separate disk. To actually store information in 3D, a totally different approach was proposed, using a single transparent material as a base. And the writing principle is actually quite simple. In fact, it is the same principle that is used when concentrating sunlight with a magnifying glass. When we align the lens of a magnifying glass with the sun and position it on a surface, it starts to burn, but this will only happen if we position the magnifying glass at the correct angle and distance. Although we can ignore the angle, because later this will be implemented with an artificial light, which will be static, leaving us with only the distance from the magnifying glass to the surface as a variable. If we move the magnifying glass too close, the light is not concentrated and if we move it farther away than necessary, the light is scattered again, leaving us a very small range in which the concentrated light is enough to burn the surface. By graphing the path that the light rays follow, we will notice that a cone is generated, and after passing the point of concentration it begins to disperse in the form of another cone, but inverted. For non-transparent materials such as wood, we can only concentrate the light on the surface, but in some transparent materials such as quartz, it is possible to generate this concentration point inside the material, affecting its structure and composition. Which again corresponds to a binary value, depending on whether this point within the volume, which we will call voxel, is marked or not. Understanding this at a conceptual level with the magnifying glass example, reality is much more complicated. Extremely precise systems are needed in their movement to generate a regular pattern of voxels that can later be read by another system. Since the smaller the voxels, the greater the amount of information that can be stored in a certain volume. Being a bit more precise, these systems are able to generate microbursts and leave independent marks with a precision in the order of micrometers, with optics capable of concentrating a beam of light leaving marks of just one micrometer. This also has other difficulties, such as controlling the energy needed to affect the material and the duration of the light pulses used. Since an excess of any of these properties would generate stress concentrations in the material, and even fractures. 
the energy used is in the order of nanojoules and the duration of the pulses in the order of hundreds of femtoseconds. That is one second divided into billions. This is a period so small that, to give you some context, if in one second light travels approximately 300 million meters, according to my calculations, in 100 femtoseconds, light would travel only 30 micrometers. So if we were able to stop time, or record the beam of light with a camera fast enough, we would literally see something similar to the Star Wars guns. And, in fact, at MIT they already did it, in 2011. But let's not get off topic, at this point we have a piece of glass with marks or bits of information distributed three-dimensionally. However, writing these bits is only half of the problem because we must consider that it must also be possible to read or identify the state of each bit even if there are others getting in the way. Fortunately, the solution is also quite simple and surely you have experienced it yourselves at some point. For example, when we have a mesh in front of us, if we focus on the mesh, we will clearly see it, and we will have trouble seeing what is behind it. But if we focus on something that is behind it, the mesh will blur and we will be able to see what is behind it without it getting in the way. Two features come into play here. The ability to vary the distance at which we can focus our view and the depth of field or range at which we can see clearly. Again, thanks to technology, this concept is taken to the extreme, with optical systems with depths of field so small that they are able to focus independently on layers that are only 10 micrometers apart. So far everything sounds great, even more, as we will see later, it was this technology that allowed us to create eternal storage, but in reality the three-dimensional storage, which by the way was proposed in the 90s, has a big limitation. Once a mark is created, it cannot be erased, which in practical terms means that there is no way to overwrite the information, which for some cases can be useful, but in most cases it is not. Now we are ready to talk about the five dimensions. It sounds pretty impressive, but it's actually not a big deal. In this context each dimension only refers to some characteristic that can vary. If we take an apple, we can move it on the x, y, and z axis, so we have the first three dimensions. But we could also consider the size, which would allow us to distinguish between apples that are in the same position. That is to say, there is a fourth dimension that allows us to categorize its state. Furthermore, we could consider their color and have a fifth dimension to analyze. Analogously, we can add new dimensions in the marks generated on the crystal by controlling some characteristics of the light pulses. But before explaining in more detail, we must first understand the concept of polarization of light. Light, or more broadly, electromagnetic radiation, can be represented as electric and magnetic fields that oscillate in the direction of propagation. Moreover, these oscillations usually lie in a plane, which is known as the plane of polarization. Sunlight, for example, has multiple planes in which the waves are oscillating, or in other words, it is not polarized. However, thanks to optical systems, it's possible to control this characteristic at will, and a clear example of this is polarized lenses that only allow access to light whose plane of polarization coincides with the characteristics of the crystal. Understanding this, if we control with extreme precision the polarization and intensity of the light pulse concentrated in the crystal, we can induce chemical reactions that naturally create microstructures in the form of grids, managing their size and orientation at will. And not only that. Perhaps the most impressive thing about this method is that if we hit these microstructures again with light pulses with different characteristics than the pulse that created them in the first place, those microstructures can be overwritten, overcoming the limitation of the previous method. But now, returning to the subject of dimensions, it is not the shape of the microstructure that is measured to obtain our two extra dimensions, but two optical characteristics that they possess, retardance and slow axis orientation. Which I will not explain, but I will leave some links in the description in case you want to do the research on your own. Considering everything we have talked about so far, if we focus on the information contained in each voxel we will have three different layers. The first and simplest is whether there is a mark or not, with which we have one bit of information. 
The second one is the retardant's intensity, which after categorizing them also gives us a bit of information. And finally the orientation of the slow axis, which can be calculated with great precision, allowing to distinguish up to eight different values without major reading errors, or in other words, up to three bits of information. Unfortunately, if there is no mark, none of the other two characteristics would exist. So let us assume that there must always be a mark. Even with that condition, we would be able to store up to four bits of information or 16 distinct values per voxel, compared to only one bit or two possible values with the old method. If we consider all the characteristics we have talked about so far, a disk of 120 mm in diameter and 1.2 mm thick, which is the same shape of CD, DVD, and Blu-ray, would theoretically be able to store up to 360 terabytes of information, which would be equivalent to about 7,200 Blu-ray discs of 50 gigabytes. 360 solid state drives of 1 terabyte or 23 hard drives of 16 terabytes. Whichever comparison you prefer, it's still quite a lot. Having explained the five dimensions issue, we are now ready to talk about what they mean by this technology being able to store information eternally. Since the marks are physically made in the material, durability actually refers to the structural and chemical stability of the material. In the case of the polymers used in discs, they are prone to change their chemical composition over time. When exposed to temperatures in the order of dozens or hundreds of degrees Celsius or even when exposed to ultraviolet radiation. Quartz, on the other hand, is a material with high mechanical, thermal, and chemical stability. I was thinking of using the Ellingham diagram to explain how stable is highly stable, but I did not understand it. Just look at that amount of different scales. But do not worry because I will use another data to reinforce the same point, and that is that quartz, silica or silicon dioxide is the second most abundant molecule in the Earth's crust. And one of the reasons for its abundance is its stability, because if it were easily affected by any of these variables, it would decompose or interact with other elements to a greater extent, reducing its abundance. But that's only half the story. Remember the microstructures generated by light pulses? These are generated by a rapid increase in temperature, but, more specifically, at the chemical level what happens is a decomposition of silicon dioxide into silicon and oxygen separately. Which in practical terms means that now we have the opposite problem. If these react again and join together, the structure would disappear and we would lose the information. Fortunately, at low temperatures, this process happens very slowly. And I am talking in the order of billions of years. Clearly this period cannot be checked empirically, However there are techniques such as the Arrhenius equation that allow us to link the rate at which a reaction occurs with its current temperature. In this case, several experiments were carried out at high temperatures to analyze the behavior of the reaction and thus project its speed at lower temperatures, obtaining as a result that at 462 Kelvin or 189 degrees Celsius, the reaction would take 13.8 million years to occur being comparable with the estimated age of the universe. This calculation does not take into account the effect of temperature changes over time or other factors that might affect the durability of the data. But as I mentioned before, quartz is an exceptionally stable material. Now that we understand how this technology works, why don't we use it? Even though the publication I based this chapter on is from 2016 and advances have continued to be made, you must understand that the precision and complexity of the systems used to write and subsequently read the data is not something that can be easily miniaturized enough to have in our homes, and even less in a portable device. At least for now. Moreover, although I did not find the price of the machines used to do the experiments, we can use the femtosecond laser eye surgery devices as a benchmark which cost about half a million dollars. Perhaps not the best comparison, but even if it cost half or even a quarter of that, it would still be quite a lot. But all this does not mean that the technology is not useful. 
For some particular cases in which you want to store information for long periods of time, or you want to send information over long distances, and it is not feasible to use other means, you could use this technology. I hope you liked this episode. If you think what I do is worthwhile you can subscribe, share or even support me through Patreon to make more and better videos. That's all for now and see you in the next video.